DOA 1, The Hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. On today's program, you will hear stories from Brian Lynn and Alice Bryant. Later, Anna Mateo answers a question from an English learner. Can a sentence begin with a conjunction? We close our show with an American story. This week, it is The Purloined Letter by Edgar Allan Poe. But first... China is reportedly building a wall along its border with Vietnam to stop people and goods from leaving China. Plans to construct a two-meter-high border wall in southwestern China were reported in October by Radio Free Asia. The report was based on information collected from social media and comments from individuals living in areas near the construction. Experts say the wall appears to be an attempt by China's government to keep its citizens at home and reduce smuggling across both sides of the border. The plan demonstrates Chinese concerns about migrants going to Vietnam after China's unemployment rate grew to 6% in the first half of 2020. Economic difficulties caused by COVID-19 restrictions worldwide have weakened demand for manufactured exports from China. This has led to reductions in factory-related jobs. The Hong Kong-based workers' rights group China Labor Bulletin says Chinese workers are protesting pay cuts as their companies reduce production or go out of business. Alexander Vuving is a professor at the Daniel K. Inouye Asia-Pacific Center for Security Studies in Hawaii. He told VOA the most likely reason China would build such a border wall is to keep control. The wall would be a perfect tool to control the flows of people, of things, of everything across the border, Vuving said. The Chinese government does not like its citizens leaving the country without approval, especially if they take money out. Video posted to Chinese social media in late October appeared to show about 1,000 Chinese migrant workers gathering in southwestern China near a border crossing with Vietnam. In Vietnam, about 900,000 people were unemployed as of June 30th, and another 18 million were underemployed, the country's General Statistics Office reported. Even with those numbers, factories supported by Chinese investors welcome workers from China because of their experience with companies at home. Investors picked Vietnam to avoid paying tariffs on goods exported directly from China to the United States, said Nguyen Tong Trung. He is the director of the Center for International Studies at the University of Social Sciences and Humanities in Ho Chi Minh City. Nguyen said the tariffs resulted from a three-year-old China-U.S. trade dispute. The trade war between China and the U.S., that's the reason why so many Chinese companies come to Vietnam 
to avoid Chinese tariffs, and that's the reason they need Chinese labor," he said. Professor Vuving said a wall along any border would have the added effects of blocking escapes by Chinese political dissidents and stopping casino visitors from taking money out of the country. China is also building a fence along parts of its border with Myanmar, a popular spot for Chinese casino visitors. China is Vietnam's biggest trading partner, with about one hundred billion dollars in business during the first ten months of 2020. Most of that amount represents exports to Vietnam. Carl Thayer is a professor of Southeast Asian Studies at Australia's University of New South Wales. He told VOA that a border wall could help both countries. Vietnam has as much interest as China in closing cross-border smuggling. Particularly since it has such a massive trade deficit with China, Thayer said. I'm Brian Lin. Award-winning American comedian and actor Dave Chappelle is set to buy a former fire station near his Ohio hometown. He plans to turn it into a space where other comedians. Can perform live shows. The Miami Township Fire Station will be sold to Chappelle's company. It is situated in the town of Yellow Springs, Ohio, where Chappelle lives. His future comedy club will seat 140 people. The Dayton Daily News reported. The closing date for the sale. Is set for early 2021," said Lisa Abel. She is president of the Yellow Springs Development Corporation, which is carrying out the sale. Corey Van Ostel is a board member of the corporation. She said the Yellow Springs company wanted a buyer who would breathe life into the station. We think this will bring a new class of jobs to town," Van Ostel said. We also considered that Chappelle is a minority business owner," she added. Chappelle has a history of employing minorities," she said, and is firm about supporting the voices of people of color. Chappelle's ties to Ohio go back to his father. William David Chappelle studied at Antioch College, a private liberal arts school in Yellow Springs. Later, he became a professor there. Chappelle lives with his family outside the village and also owns homes in the nearby town of Zinia. In June, Chappelle held a private. Outdoor social commentary performance on his property in Yellow Springs. Attendees were socially distant and wore facial coverings. The event was filmed and later released on the video streaming service Netflix under the name Eight Forty Six. The number refers to the police killing last year. Of George Floyd in Minneapolis, Minnesota, a police officer named Derek Chauvin kneeled on Floyd's neck for almost nine minutes straight, killing the man. The event led to months of demonstrations against police abuse of black and brown people. Chappelle is best known. For his television comedy program, Chappelle Show, he is also a highly respected live comedy performer. His shows often examine race and gender issues with humor. 
In 2019, he received the Mark Twain Prize for American Humor. The award goes to people who have influenced American society in ways similar to Mark Twain, the 19th century American writer. I'm Alice Bryant. This week on Ask a Teacher, we answer a question from Yi Jun. Yi Jun asks if it is correct to begin a sentence with conjunctions such as and, but, and or. Their grammar book, this person adds, says no. It is completely acceptable to begin a sentence with the words and, but, and or. Conjunction words like these join together sentences, clauses, or phrases. Sometimes starting a sentence with a conjunction makes your writing sound better. It can keep your thoughts clearly separate. And it can add importance to a thought, like in this example. Not only is Stella my sister, she also is my best friend. And she is a great business partner, too. Other times, it might be better to use a different word, such as however. The word however sounds a bit more formal and serious than but. The right word choice depends on the kind of writing you are doing. Let's look at another example. This one is from a recent Words and Their Stories article on the Learning English website. Listen for the two sentences that begin with a conjunction. To make it on Broadway, you have to be very good. But you also have to be tough. Actors usually have many doors closed in their faces before other doors, hopefully, open. But even if you are hardworking and gifted, you may also need something else to succeed on Broadway. Luck. Yi Chan's question is not surprising. Many people are taught to avoid using conjunction words at the start of sentences. In fact, experts at merriamwebster.com write, Everybody agrees that it's all right to begin a sentence with and. And nearly everybody admits to having been taught at some past time that the practice was wrong. And that is Ask a Teacher. What question do you have about American English? Send us an email at learningenglish at voanews.com. I'm Ana Mateo. To help protect yourself against the new coronavirus, wash your hands for 20 seconds with soap and water before you eat, after using the toilet, and after touching anything many other people touch, like a seat on a public bus. If you cannot wash your hands with soap and water, use an alcohol-based hand sanitizer that contains at least 60% alcohol. Taking these steps can help prevent not only the new coronavirus disease, but also colds, flu, and other viruses. For more information, visit the following websites. The World Health Organization at www.who.int or the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention at www.cdc.gov.
Our story today is called The Purloined Letter. It was written by Edgar Allan Poe. Poe is generally known for his horror stories. This is the third of three stories he wrote about Auguste Dupin and how he solves crimes. The story is about a stolen letter. It first appeared in 1844 in a yearly magazine. It was reprinted in many publications, newspapers, and books. This is one of Poe's stories that influenced the development of the modern detective story. One evening in Paris, during the autumn of 1845, I went to visit a friend, Auguste Dupin. We were smoking our pipes and talking when the door of his apartment opened. Mr. Germain, the head of the Paris police force, came into the room. I came to ask your advice, Germain said to my friend Dupin. I'm trying to solve a very important case. It is also a very simple case, so I really need your help. But I thought you would like to hear about it, because it is so strange. My men and I have worked on this case for three months, Germain said. It is a very simple case of robbery, but we still cannot solve it. Dupin took the pipe out of his mouth. Perhaps the mystery is too simple, he said. Germain began to laugh. Too simple, he said. Who ever heard of such a thing? I looked at Germain. Why don't you tell us the problem, I said. Germain stopped laughing and sat down. All right, he said. But you must never tell anyone I told you this. The wife of a very important person needs help. I cannot tell you her name, because her husband is a powerful man in the French government. Let us just call her Madame X. Three months ago, someone stole a letter from Madame X. She is offering a large amount of money to anyone who can return the letter to her. We know that her husband's political enemy, Mr. Darcy, stole the letter. We also know it is somewhere in his apartment. Darcy plans to use the letter to embarrass Madame X's husband and destroy his political power. As you know... I have keys which can open any lock in Paris. For the last three months, my man and I have spent every evening looking for the letter in his apartment. But we cannot find it. Dupin stopped smoking. Tell me how you looked for it, he said. Germain moved forward in his chair. We took our time, he said. First, we examined the furniture in every room. We opened all the drawers. We looked under the rugs. We searched behind all the paintings on the walls. We opened every book. We removed the boards of the floor. We even took the tops off the tables to see if he had hidden the letter in the table legs. But we cannot find it. What do you advise me to do? Dupin puffed on his pipe. What does the letter look like? he asked. It is in a white envelope with a red stamp, Germain said. The address is written in large black letters. Dupin puffed on his pipe again. I advise you to go back and search the apartment again, he said. About one month later, Germain came back to see us. 
I followed your advice, he said, but I still have not found the letter. Dupin smiled. I knew you would not find it, he said. Germant became very red in the face. Then why did you make me search the apartment again, he shouted. My dear Germain, Dupin said, let me tell you a little story. Do you remember the famous doctor Louis Abernathy? No, Germain shouted. Get to the point, Dupin. Of course, of course, Dupin said. Once a rich old man met Abernathy at a party. The old man was not feeling very well. He decided he would get a medical opinion from the doctor without paying for it. So he described his problems to Abernathy. Now, doctor, the old man said, suppose you had a patient like that. What would you tell him to take? Oh, that is quite simple, said Abernathy. I would tell him to take my advice. Germant looked embarrassed. Look here, Dupin, I'm perfectly willing to pay for advice. Dupin smiled at Germant. How much money did you say the reward was? he asked. Germant sighed. I do not want to tell you the exact amount, but I would give 50,000 francs to the person who helps me find that letter. In that case, Dupin said, take out your checkbook and write me a check for 50,000 francs. When you have signed the check, I will give you the letter. Germain looked at Dupin with his mouth open. His eyes seemed to jump out of his head. Then he took out his checkbook and pen and wrote a check for 50,000 francs. He gave it to Dupin. My friend examined the check carefully and put it in his pocket. Then he unlocked a drawer of his desk, took out the letter, and gave it to Germain. The policeman's hand shook as he opened the letter. He read it quickly. Then he put it in his pocket and ran out of the room without saying a word. Dupin, I said, as I turned to my friend, how did you solve the mystery? It was simple, my friend, he said. Germain and his policeman could not find the letter because they did not try to understand the mind of the man who stole it. Instead, they looked for the letter where they would have hidden it. Mr. Darcy is not a policeman. He is, however, very intelligent. He knew the police would search his apartment. He also knew how police think, so... He did not hide the letter where he knew they would look for it. Do you remember how Germain laughed when I said the mystery was difficult for him to solve because it was so simple? Dupin filled his pipe with tobacco and lit it. Well, the more I thought about it, the more I realized the police could not find the letter because Darcy had not hidden it at all. So, I went to visit Darcy in his apartment. I took a pair of dark green eyeglasses with me. I explained to him that I was having trouble with my eyes and needed to wear the dark glasses at all times. He believed me. The glasses permitted me to look around the apartment while I seemed only to be talking to him. I paid special attention to a large desk where there were a lot of papers and books. However, I saw nothing suspicious there. After a few minutes, however, I noticed a small shelf over the fireplace, a few postcards, 
and a letter were lying on the shelf. The letter looked very old and dirty. As soon as I saw this letter, I decided it must be the one I was looking for. It must be, even though it was completely different from the one Germain had described. This letter had a large green stamp on it. The address was written in small letters, in blue ink. I memorized every detail of the letter while I talked to Darcy. Then, when he was not looking, I dropped one of my gloves on the floor under my chair. The next morning I stopped at his apartment to look for my glove. While we were talking, we heard people shouting in the street. Darcy went to the window and looked out. Quickly, I stepped to the shelf and put the letter in my pocket. Then I replaced it with a letter that looked exactly like it, which I had taken with me. I had made it the night before. The trouble in the street was caused by a man who had almost been run over by a horse and carriage. He was not hurt, and soon the crowd of people went away. When it was over, Darcy came away from the window. I said goodbye and left. The man who almost had an accident was one of my servants. I had paid him to create the incident. Dupin stopped talking to light his pipe. I did not understand. But Dupin, I said, why did you go to the trouble of replacing the letter? Why not just take it and leave? Dupin smiled. Darcy is a dangerous man, he said. And he has many loyal servants. If... I had taken the letter. I might never have left his apartment alive. The Purloined Letter was written by Edgar Allan Poe and adapted by Donna De Sanctis. The storyteller was Shep O'Neill. The producer was Lawan Davis. Mm-hmm.